I'm here to introduce a couple speakers to talk about restoring public confidence in water quality. Um, I'm, I'm actually a sociologist by training, so I'm sure I will deviate from the topic by actually broadening the lens and, and, and expanding out to talk about more than just our confidence in water. Um, but uh, I think we're definitely going to use Gen X as an example to talk here about risk communication. And for our speakers, we have, um, first of all, Dr. Andy Binder. Uh, from North Carolina State University, and he's going to talk to us about risk communication research. Um, Dr. Binder is a, a communications professor who does a lot with quantitative survey research, looking at a variety of issues that involve uh, how science risk gets communicated to the public, and I assume received by the public uh, when it is communicated. Uh, and we also have a uh, Mr. Tim White from the Fayetteville Observer. Uh, he brings 47 years oh, of journalistic <laughs> and editing experience. He's currently the editor for the uh, opinion page for the Fayetteville Observer, and I trust that keeps him very busy. Uh, I am a Mid-Basin representative uh, for the Cape Fear River Assembly. I also want to give a quick shout out, since I have a moment here, to Sustainable Sandhills. Uh, I'm currently the Vice Chair of the Board for Sustainable Sandhills, and they are a fantastic organization in the Mid-Basin. Uh, and some of them uh, were not able to be with us today, but it's because of Sustainable Sandhills that I found the Cape Fear, Cape Fear River Assembly, and I uh, have just absolutely um, learned so much from this organization. Uh, I feel like I'm a part of North Carolina, and I feel like the Cape Fear River is my river, and um, and uh, although I may never understand analytic chemistry, I, I really do feel that uh, I have stretched myself uh, in, in this role with this board. So I want to include, I just want to encourage real quick uh, those who are here who maybe haven't been here before to maybe join the board and attend more of the events because uh, this organization does something that other organizations do not do. Okay, so real quickly, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna start with uh, Dr. Binder and he's got a PowerPoint slide presentation for us about risk communication and trust. Um, and then we're gonna have some comments uh, from Tim White and, uh, and if there's any time at the end, I guess we'll take some questions. Uh, I think we've got at least 45 minutes worth of, of juicy information for you, so stay tuned. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so Tim and I were just talking before the session about how uh, he's got this vast experience in environmental journalism, and I have a lot of experience in um, studying people. I have the privilege of studying people for a living, which is People are messy, right? Um, but I think one of the things that I've learned in the research that I've done on how people develop opinions and attitudes about different scientific and technological topics is that there are some systematic things that we can learn from people, um, and that's what I'm here to share with you today. So I'm going to give you a bit of a kind of high level, um, some of the concepts we work with in the academic research, and then I think Tim is going to be a really great person to sort of tie in how that works on the ground in the environmental journalism that he's done for decades. Um, so I'm an associate professor of communication, and just recently I was brought in as a co-director of the Community Engagement Corps at the Center for Human Health and the Environment at NC State University. So some of the people at that center are doing work on Gen X. It's very uh, interesting and innovative and insightful for the human health impacts. Um, so I'm coming at this sort of as a newbie um, I don't know quite as much about the Gen X stuff as I'd like to, but I can share with you what I've learned from other research on risk um, and communication. So basically, uh, I've divided my talk into three different areas. Um, the first area, real quick, is just to sort of recap how people like myself, social scientists, think about risk. Um, so I'm going to share with you some possible definitions of risk. I'm going to talk briefly about different people's interests and values and how those play into how people pay attention to different risks in their everyday lives. 
And then I'm going to end by talking about um, different aspects of attention, motivation, and action, because those are ultimately what we're interested in, in a group like this, in actually um, bringing about <coughs> action that changes things. So uh, to begin with, with definitions of risk, whenever I talk about risk with um, people, and they might be new to a social science perspective, I like to refer to uh, the Roman god Janus, who famously was facing in two different directions, right? And the way, the reason I like this image is because it sort of highlights how people can see two things from completely different angles and maybe talk past each other, which is one of the things I find when I am engaging with scientists um, and people from scientific backgrounds and how they want to think about how people, how lay people think about something as complicated as risk. And so, when thinking about risk in terms of these the two-faced uh, approach, on the one hand, we have technical risk, right? Which is a definition that many of the people in this room are very familiar with, right? We have risk that we can go out and measure hazards. We can see, we can set levels that might be acceptable levels for those hazards for people to be exposed to, right? We have doses and exposures. We can understand it that way. Um, so that's often how people think about risk. But another perspective on risk um, is focused on how risk is also a social construction, right? There are certain problems in our society that we focus on and try to solve, and other problems that we do not pay attention to and sort of fall by the wayside. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about risk as a social construction. You know, I have colleagues, I had a colleague in my department um, who took this to the extreme, right? Extreme perspectives on social construction would say that there is no desk here right, table here in front of me. It's only there because we agree as human beings that it's there. That's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about um, the idea that what is risk, what we label as a risk, right, is something that is negotiated based on our interests and values. Um, and so, in a way, I'm trying to get us away from thinking about technical risk as being rational on the one hand, and the social construction of risk is being sort of emotional and unruly on the other hand, right? So there's facets of both rationality and emotion in both technical risk and the social elements of risk. And I just want us to be mindful of that as we have this discussion about um, thinking of ways in which we can earn the trust of the public in talking about water quality. So basically, when I come at risk, I think about it as being risk is a perception, and the perception is itself its own reality, right? So I study how people take in stimuli from the external world and how they make sense of that in their heads. Um, so one of the important points is that acknowledging risk perception as its own systematic response to hazards is important because that's what, understanding how people react to these things is an important thing to know. Um, it's, you know, Oftentimes, I people come to me and be like, people are so scared of airplanes and airplane crashes. Why are they so irrational? They should be concerned about cars, right? Well, there's good reasons why we're not terrified of getting into a car, because I just had to drive two hours on I-40 to get here from Raleigh, right? Like, I can't live my life without getting into a car, and so I'm going to maybe be less concerned about that risk and more concerned about something that's more rare, but potentially more catastrophic. Um, so risk judgments for everyone, all the people in this room included, all have a basis in our subjective senses and experiences regardless of whose experiences they are, right? Experts versus lay publics. Um, so that's where I'm coming from when I think about uh, risk communication and communicating about these things. The second thing I wanted to talk about today is uh, the idea of interests and values. And this was brought to my attention recently in a workshop we had at NC State. Um, by a colleague uh, who had people discuss this in depth. And I thought it was a really interesting idea. So what are our interests and what are our values? And these are actually two very different things to consider, right? An interest is, what do I want to see happen, right? What is the outcome that I want to have achieved in whatever it is I'm interested in, in paying attention to? In this case, it might be you know, cleaning up the water. Um, and the value that comes into play is the reason underlying, right, the foundation or the core value that underlies that interest. Why do I want that and what motivates me to want that? So when it comes to understanding interests and values and the things that pay attention to when it comes to risks in our everyday lives, um, 
it's easy to, to think like, well, people just don't have the information they need. If they had all the information they needed, then, then they would pay attention and we wouldn't have to, you know, always be sounding the alarm bell or something. Um, but what I want to show you is some survey data from a study I did actually on perceptions of using recycled water in people's homes that really beautifully illustrates how your interests and values can really dramatically shift on what you have a shift on what you pay attention to. And in this survey, I asked people, what is the most important environmental problem? I took it from another survey, um, and it had nine response options. And here's what the results look like um, in the initial survey. So uh, there's a couple that are relevant to our discussion today. So at the bottom, there's air pollution, chemicals and pesticides, water pollution. Interesting, right, in hindsight, that those three things are separated when I can be concerned about water pollution when there are the pollutants to be concerned about as well. Um, other items that came up that were pinging very highly on people's radar, right? Uh, climate change, using up our natural resources, water shortages, um, that played into that uh, research project I was working on, which had to do with you know, addressing water shortages through recycled water. Um, and then uh, another big category was none of these which is the green column way in the back. So what I want to show you is a model that I built using these responses, and I was trying to predict how people were choosing between these nine different options, right? And it turns out that something like, I threw in something like scientific knowledge. So we measured scientific knowledge. We had a bunch of true and false questions about science. We asked people. It had almost no influence on how people answered these questions. Right. The distribution here that you see was basically the same, regardless of how much knowledge people had. What did have a huge impact was questions like, um, questions measuring how environmental people were, like how much they valued the environment. And so on the bottom of the screen, you have a scale of one to seven. So if you score a one, you have, you do not value the environment, right? It's just not something that you think about in your everyday life. That's those people. That's not to say they don't care about anything, right? They just care about other stuff. And if you're on a seven, you have the highest level of environmentalism on this scale. So what you see is, if I show the, the low environmentalism people first, the lowest people, the biggest category, right, is that none of these things are important. It's like 40% of, of that group of people. Um, and as you move up the scale, you can keep an eye on that green bar in the background. If I can get the thing to click. click. Okay. The green bar decreases right, dramatically as you go down up the scale of environmentalism. And what goes up in terms of people's concerns, using up our natural resources, climate change, um, those sort of hot button issues that get a lot of news coverage that people talk about a lot. Um, there's uh, GM Foods has a really interesting distribution where people seem most concerned about it who are kind of midway up the environmentalism scale. Um, chemicals and pesticides is similar, actually. Um, and then water shortages, water pollution. Water pollution is sort of a flat line, which is interesting as well. Um, the other question that was a big predictor in terms of how people chose different options on this survey question was how much do you trust scientists? to tell you the truth about, about what's happening in the world, right? Um, and we can look at that distribution as well, where as you move up the trust and science scale, similarly, you have the green bar goes down dramatically. So people are much more able to pick something, right, um, that is an environmental problem. Uh, you have something like using up our natural resources, basically doesn't change, right? It's high on people's radar regardless of how much they trust scientists. The same thing with something like water pollution, water shortages, um, and chemicals and pesticides, right? So that's, in a general sense, when it comes down to sort of addressing specific risk issues, I can talk later about how that might change. Um, but the bottom line is that when um, you're trying to take into account what people are worried about, um, one of the things we should be mindful of is we need to find a common ground, right? And finding common ground is rooted in finding our shared interests and values rather than right, getting into information and facts and sort of um, these ways of communicating that we know don't necessarily work very well with a lay audience. 
And so it's really important to capitalize on how you know, we have a shared interest in environmentalism, probably in this room. We have a shared trust in scientists. And how can we leverage that, uh, those relationships, building relationships with people based on those things, in order to communicate risk effectively? Um, and so without the, the key ingredients of trust and competence, we might never solve problems because we don't have that common ground to build it off of. Which brings me to my final section, right? So addressing attention, motivation, and action. Um, one, how do we find risks, right? How do we pay attention to different risks? Two, how do we gather political will to develop solutions? And then three, how do we follow through and, and fix them? Um, these are all things that um, kind of come up in different ways in the risk communication literature. One of the ways I like, one of the graphs um, that I was first introduced in graduate school that I really like a lot um, is this is a sociologist named Freudenberg who came up with this concept of the atrophy of vigilance, right? So for anything that's risky in our lives, we have, we can't worry about everything we should be worrying about all the time, right? We have to be selective. And so one way we do that is that over time, we are vigilant about certain things. And so if you think of just one thing in particular, um, over time, your vigilance on that thing, right? It's a straight line downward, probably a little bit more fluid than that. Um, but when something happens, right, when an accident happens, when an event happens related to that thing, um, right, contaminated romaine lettuce, for example, right? How many people are going around now, think about romaine lettuce, okay, never mind spinach, what about romaine lettuce? Um, so an accident, an event, right, something happens, and all of a sudden we're paying more attention to this. And over time, as that thing gets lost in the background, we get concerned about other things, we just don't pay attention to it anymore. Um, or as much anymore. And so that's one thing to keep in mind is that this is a phenomenon that happens all the time, right? So not everybody's gonna pay attention to everything all the time. What does that mean for getting people's attention? Well, two common problems in risk communication are problem one, persistent unwavering warning messages, right? And problem two is apathetic responses from audiences. So if you're constantly sounding the alarm bell, people are just gonna stop paying attention. Right? Who remembers this graphic on the right? Right? Where? How? When was it green? Does anybody remember? <laughs> Never. Blue. I don't think it was ever blue. Like it was always orange or yellow. Right? There's always some imminent risk of something happening, but never catastrophic, and it's never like sit back and relax. Um, so as a result, I mean, I, I believe that this whole system was retired because they realized it was serving no purpose, right? If it's always going to be orange or yellow, then, then who cares, people stop paying attention. So there's a communication model um, that's really useful in building off of this idea that with the persistent unwavering warning message, people just aren't going to pay attention. And it sort of it works to explain this, right? So if you look at the top of my slide, I have message number one, like here's a risk. Here's something you need to be worried about. If that's all you tell people, what's going to happen is they're going to revert to this idea of a fear control response. And a fear control response means I'm going to focus more on controlling the negative emotion that I feel about the potential for this risk to harm me than I am to do anything about actually doing it, right? Um, controlling it. So a fear control response is just what are some responses? Uh, not paying attention to the message, right? Ignoring the message, um, discounting the message, all of that kind of stuff. The alternative to that is message number two, right? Here's a risk, and here's what you can do about it. So when we couple the message that is a, a threat message with what is the technical term for is an efficacy message, right? Some sense of efficacy, like what can you do to protect yourself from the risk? Then people are much more likely to enter into response number two, which is a danger control response, right? I'm going to focus on the danger and do whatever I can to mitigate my exposure to the danger, to mitigate my continued exposure to the danger, to do something to control um, how that's going to work. Now, I will add one thing, which is in order for this to be effective, right, the thing that you tell people to do actually has to do something. <laughs> so it's like there has to be a self-efficacy component so that people have to be able to do the thing and a response efficacy component, which is the thing actually has to do, has to work, right? Um, 
So when I, uh, way before I was in grad school, I was a Peace Corps volunteer and I lived in Central Africa for two years and I did a lot of HIV and AIDS education. I remember one night I was at a bar and this guy was like, I know how I cannot get AIDS. Uh, if I have sex with a woman and it's unprotected sex, all I have to do is go home and the next morning I will pee in a cup and drink my own urine. And I was at the bar and I was like, I don't know what to say to this. <laughs> like, this is a college educated guy. Uh, but it's a great example of that, right? So like, he, he believed that that would do something, which I guess is a thing, but knowing that it's not gonna, knowing that it's not gonna do anything, right? I don't know. I, <laughs> it was a very disheartening night um, in my burgeoning youth as a, as a risk communicator. So, one of the reasons I like this model is because it, it, can, it can inspire action at different levels of engagement. So, the citizen who's concerned about their family, you can tell them what to do to protect their family, right? Here's a problem and here's what you can do to protect your family. You can also think about it in terms of messages to elected officials, right? Here's a problem and here's what I need you to do to protect my family and earn my vote, right? Or I'll go to the other person. Um, message to a water utility or an unnamed chemical company, here's a problem, and here's how you need to fix it or else we'll sue your plant off, right? So there's different ways I think we can think about how these messages could work at different levels. Um, all of this is, is to build off of this attribute vigilance model, right? So if we look at this again, um, one way to think about it is that every time something happens, thankfully there's an alternative curve, right? Which is that we're accumulating understanding of risk. And it's incremental, like we'll fix something, um, and then we have a temporary fix, and then something else will happen, and we'll build off of what we learned before. And so there's an upward trajectory, which is, which is positive um, news. Another thing, though, is that, and this is one thing that a scholar named Peter Sandman emphasizes in his work on risk communication, is the idea of accountability. So we have this the vigilance over time, and we need to we need to also be mindful of earning trust from people. Now, I was just talking to this about this with a colleague the other day, and she said something really interesting. A lot of people like to say, we need to build trust. We need to, you know, they sort of use this active verb in terms of trust, but you can't just construct trust out of nothing, right? And so another way to think about it is to be accountable is a way of earning trust, right? So we're not gonna take people's trust from them. We need to demonstrate that we are capable of taking care of them, that we're accountable, and in that way, we can earn more trust. And so here's a, a model of how trust works, right? Commonly, there is somebody who's responsible for something, and an accident happens, and everybody's trust plummets, right? And maybe by leveraging you know, relationships that existed before this event or whatever, they're able to rebuild trust, but possibly not at the level it was before. You know, I think what some scholars like Samuel would argue is that, you know, if you are more accountable, if you are out there being accountable, then you're more likely to maintain that level of trust and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Um, it's also, this idea of earning trust is also interesting to me because it's not so focused on like the ends. Right? It's that if we focus on the means, which is let's be accountable as a philosophy, then the ends that come with that um, are going to be trust. Um, so that's uh, the basic overview of what I wanted to cover in my talk. Um, perception is reality, that there's an emphasis on finding common ground, and then communicating accountability, and then hopefully as a result of that, earning people's trust. Um, there's a slide with references. If anybody wants to have a, a copy of my PowerPoint presentation, I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, but I do also want to give time to Tim for his comments. I'm pretty sure we're going to be posting these PowerPoints at some point on our website for the Cape Fear River Assembly. So if you feel like you missed something, um, yes. And the video. Uh, which I now realize self-consciously that I'll be starring in for my five minutes of pain. <laughs> and so I'm, we're going to let Tim White roll here um, and respond 
by giving us some examples of how he sees this applying to the, the Gen X controversy, which I know he has been writing about on the op-ed pages, because I've been just following a little closely. Bit. <laughs> just a little bit, every now and then, occasionally. And, uh, you know, I, I, I come to you today um, with no answers. Um, I'm a journalist. Um, I'm an opinion journalist. That's even worse. Um, we're, we're, we're generally defined as the ones that come down out of the hills after dark to shoot the wounded. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to be able to solve all these problems, but I, I do come with a lot of questions. Um, and, and how did we get in this condition that we're, we're in? And, and uh, Andy, Andy raised some, some really really good uh, really good points here uh, because inspiring action uh, is one of the things that a lot of us in this room need to do um, whether you're with the Cape Fear River Assembly or whether you're a researcher who's who's figuring out what what is this stuff in our water uh, whether you're uh, running a public utility and you've got to figure out what to do with it and who's going to pay for it we're all dealing with a ton of challenges right here um, and, and, and the first thing we collide with is, is how do institutions, the government institutions, the scientific institutions, all of them, build trust and understanding. Uh, and here's the, here's the key. If you're going to do it well, you had to have been doing it before the stuff hit the fan. You had to have been doing that trust building before we discovered that we have a big problem. Now, here we are with Gen X. We didn't do that. Some of you did. Some of you did. You know, I'm, I'm listening to the, to the uh, Public Water Authority presentation about this wonderfully open uh, relationship you have with your customers where, where they call in and say, I've got a problem, what's wrong with my water? And you do your dead level best to answer them. Um, that's not exactly what we've seen from our, our General Assembly, from our, from our legislators. Um, you know, this, they have the more difficult approach of saying, what problem? I don't see a problem. There's no problem. And if there is a problem, the companies will take care of it for themselves because it's in their best interest. Uh, and, and so we're just, we're just going to ignore it because deregulation means everybody, everybody makes more money. Um, how's that working out for you these days? Uh, if you're a, a member of the General Assembly from, from this, this part of the Cape Fear region? Probably not as well. But here's another question. How does this translate to lawmakers across the state? You know, one or two people may lose their political jobs in, in this region, unless they really get with it and really work very hard to deal with the Gen X, et cetera, uh, pollution problem. But, um, but they're a small portion of, of our General Assembly. What's everybody else going to do? You know, are we are we going to be able to get enough people in the General Assembly to actually do something about it? And and I mean, we see a wonderful illustration right now. The House gets it apparently. Um, the House bill that's that's before the General Assembly right now um, looks like it's got some pretty good stuff in it. Um, it. It looks like it was actually tailored to try to meet some needs. The Senate bill really seems to me at least, to be engineered to see to it that it gets even more difficult to, to be a regulator in, in the state of North Carolina. Uh, that, that they're changing the rules, um, but they're not giving anybody any extra tools. So what do we do? Um, this is, what, what do the press and the public do when we have these multiple agencies? We, we, got, we got some that are doing the right stuff and some that are doing the wrong stuff. Um, what do the press and the public do uh, about this? And, and, and here's, here's the trick. Everybody who's got a stake in this, in this game has to get involved and speak up. Um, hiding out doesn't work. Um, thinking that somebody else is going to take care of it doesn't work really well. If we're going to assess, assess that we've got a risk. And, and OK, we, we all, we're all sold. Everybody in this room is certainly sold. Um, probably most of the people who live in the Wellington area in New Hanover County, they're pretty well sold. Um, but the people that are the bulk of my readers up in Cumberland County, mm, some of them are sold. Especially the ones that live in southern Cumberland County who can't use their wells anymore, they're really sold. 
Um, but but the people who live in Fayetteville, who are well, who get their water from quite a bit upstream of of the Commerce plant, they're saying, oh, you know, there may be a problem down there. Gee whiz. So what do you folks do, whether you're doing research or whether you're trying to influence public policy, how do we all go to the people of Fayetteville or the people of Greensboro uh, or, or the people of, well, I was going to say Asheville, but Asheville's, uh, they're already sold. Uh, everybody in Asheville is, is busy hugging trees, so they're, 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 all, they're all fine. Um, but, but, you know, how do you, how do you sell all of these other people? And, and one of the things you do is, is what the less them our, our state DEQ regulators are doing, and that is they're trying to assess the level of threat across the state. Um, what's out there? You know, I, I, I work in Fable, but I live up in, in Chatham County. Um, so I thought, well, wait, I, I got no problem, and, and now I'm hearing of bromides in Pittsburgh water. I live near Pittsburgh, right? Bromides, uh, uh, how about dioxane? Oh, that. Well, we all got to talk about that. We got to talk about all of these threats, not just Gen X. I mean, this is, I, I think it's the biggest revelation that we've had in the last couple of months is that it ain't Gen X. It's a whole bunch <laughs> of bad stuff that's out there, or potentially bad stuff. And we all need, to talk and speak up and communicate a message to the people who can make something change. Um, and and, and you know, what, what do you do? The scientific community, for example, how do you effectively communicate with a largely non-scientific media, that's us, me, English major, right? Good luck. Uh, did I understand a lot of the technical uh, stuff that was going on this morning? No, I did not. But you, as, as the science community, the research community, I gotta try and understand what you're doing and you gotta try and speak in ways that I will understand it because I'm, I'm your route to communicate. I can help you communicate it, I can, I can do it. If you've, if you've never sat down and talked to a journalist, I, I, I suggest you do it um, before, again, the stuff hits the fan, you know? Do you know the journalists in, in, who cover your community, who cover issues in your community? Have you met them? Um, you ought to. Um, we love company. You know, we, we, we're real happy to talk to people. Come on in, have a cup of coffee, and, and tell me what your issues are. I love doing that. Most people in my business love doing that. Um, you can't assume that we're going to understand everything that's going on out there. In fact, you should assume that we're not going to understand what's going on until you come in and give us a really good and careful explanation of what it is you're finding and why it's a problem. And maybe we'll brainstorm together about what are the answers. How do we, how do we make change happen? How do we, in this particular case, uh, apply enough political pressure to get our General Assembly to pass some laws, and especially to allocate some money uh, to get people the equipment that they need and the manpower that they need. You know, we, somebody said this morning that this, this, is not a, this is not a new human behavior that we're seeing here. Uh, North Carolina has been quite welcoming in, in a whole lot of ways to industries and their, and their effluent for a lot of generations, not just a few years. Um, we've said, y'all come on down and, and we won't look. And um, when it's been certain kinds of, of effluent that's going into our waterways, well, it's okay because they do kind of clean themselves up. Some of the old stuff, you know? I mean, that, that hog waste is not, you know, uh, before we got into factory farming anyway, that hog waste wasn't, wasn't all that bad. Uh, now we're into factory farming, it's a different question. But you know, ultimately stuff gets diluted. But, when you're talking about stuff that's dangerous in parts per trillion, um, that's a different ball game. And we need, to, we need to apply different answers to it. But, uh, but we all gotta work together if we're gonna do it. And, and then, you know, how does, finally, how does a government agency that's responding to an environmental or regulatory question, a uh, regulatory crisis, establish credibility when its elected leaders have already firmly established themselves in the opposite direction of being anti-regulatory. Um, you know, something's got to give here in North Carolina if we're going to if, if we're going to have safe water. Um, and 
probably this applies to a lot of other safety issues as well, but um, it's not going to happen unless people like you, many of you in this room, get up and get out and start, uh, start educating people. Talk with the press, talk with the public, uh, be open and honest about what you're finding, uh, be prepared to explain it in, in layman's terms. Uh, Here's, here's a secret. If you, can, if you can get the reporter to understand it, by God, everybody will understand it. <laughs> Especially if they get it right in their stories. That, that everybody's going to understand what's going on. But, you know, I, mean, I, guess, I guess my bottom line message is, is that what we're learning here is what people have learned all across the country in a lot of crises just like this, is that if we want to fix what's broke, we all got to work together and we all got to speak up. And if we do that, maybe we're going to get something done. And, I'd love to have questions or discussion or uh, uh, serious, strenuous objections. Uh, any questions? Already brewing? Yes? I don't have any questions. I just want to thank you for your uh, editorials throughout the year. They've been amazing. Thank you. What's an editorial page editor without issues, right? <laughs> uh, unemployed. <laughs> I would just like to quickly say that because I had a chance to review these PowerPoints beforehand, so I cheated on the test. Um, there is a connection here, I think, that is uh, conveniently I can fill as a sociologist. You know, people have perceptions about risk, but one thing I know as a sociologist is what people do and what people say they do are almost never the same thing. We're all sort of non-rational beings, and when we get together collectively, we're even more non-rational than we started. And which is, which is to say that I like to think that I always do the best thing and that I always recycle and that I don't, um, I, I don't put pesticides on my lawn and, right, and so on and so forth. And yet, um, I do and have done these things, and, and, but I'll never do it again in the future, right? <laughs> um, so there's this, there's this non-rational component. And so social organization around a social problem like our polluted river or our polluted waterways globally is this incredibly complex, giant problem that we can only solve if we rationally choose to respect one another's expertise, right? Which goes for us as, I'm a social scientist, I have to respect the analytic chemist, I have to learn to respect it even when I have difficulty understanding it and would like to dismiss it because it makes my brain hurt. Right, and, and, and similarly, I have to respect the political process, even though it's very slow. I have to respect the legal process, even though it's definitely, definitely way, way too slow in the future. So I, we're actually talking about like a, a, a need for rational collective action, which is what sociologists specialize in, right? And it takes all the stars in alignment for that to happen in cooperation that's, right? We all have to actually uh, give is credence to one another's expertise, including the local experience of being the person whose waterways are polluted, who has to decide whether they're going to drink the water from the tap or their children. Um, and so we kind of have brought together, I mean, this brings up, yeah, all the different issues. More burning questions for about um, risk communication. Yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to ask Andy. You, you gave the example of why people worry about getting on an airplane, they don't worry necessarily about driving the car. And I know there's a set of factors that kind of influence that. I wonder if you could mention a few of those in terms of what makes one of risk seem more serious than another. Sure. I mean, there's so many. <laughs> um, but one of the seminal studies in risk perception sort of categorize different risks in terms of how, much, how familiar they seem to people versus how scary they seem to people. And those are actually for those of you who are mathematically inclined, is like an orthogonal relationship, right? So um, there's, you can put people into, put risks into four different groups. So for example, automobiles are very familiar to us because every day probably everybody in this room sits behind the wheel of an automobile. So it's familiar to you and in a way that makes it also less scary. Whereas if you're not accustomed to getting onto an airplane every day, like some people do, right? Um, commuting to work possibly in another city, and you only do that like maybe once or twice every 10 years, then that's going to seem 
like a more scary experience, a more unfamiliar. Um, so I think that's those are two of the factors that come to mind. Yes. Listening to your your comments, uh, let me ask you to step aside from the profession and offer us an opinion. Um, when I talk to a lot of people, I get this one particular answer that bumbles me on how I can handle it. So give me some advice here on this. A lot of times I'll ask people, well, why don't you throw that can away because, you know, it cost us a bunch of money. Or why don't you not throw that out your window as you're driving along? Or why don't you do this? I get this one answer that always sort of bumbles me, and that is this. They'll say, man, I don't want to throw that away, but heck, nobody else does. I don't want to be a chump and be the one that you know, chips in on this. How, how do you deal with that? Uh, me personally, or how do I think <laughs> that function? <laughs> All three of the people on the panel, I'm asking. Um, how do you deal with it? I, I mean, I actually, and I wonder if maybe, I mean, clearly your work's informed by sociological theory as well. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I just want to say real quickly, I think that the way that we behave as a collective group of humans is a little bit different than the way we behave as individual people um, psychologically in our minds, right? And so I think that even things like health behaviors that seem really individualistic are actually collective and governed by norms and that we are all kind of, you know, even if I call myself a maverick, the truth is I follow norms from the moment I wake up in the morning until the moment, the moment I go to sleep, right? All the time. And so if I change the norms, as well as in some cases my physical environment, right? You put that bin next to me, I'm more likely to recycle. But it's more than that, right? It's actual, ha they're, they're subconsciously acquired habits is one way to think about it, right? The, the way we move through our everyday life is actually something um, habitual, 99% habit if I had to put a number on it, but it's also reinforced by every single so social interaction that I have all day long, right? So. Um, and, and even the act of politically, collectively mobilizing and trying to coordinate with different people that have different interests and different values than myself, right? And trying to create social relationships of trust with those people. Uh, I might have to go against some of my ordinary norms, right? Just even to sort of create new norms for the group even, right? Maybe um, a new way to maybe collaborate with people that you already know you disagree with on most everything, right? But maybe if we just agree on this one issue, we can kind of calibrate um, all of our different interests so that well, what we you're What you're saying is I've got to go out there right? and, so and create a I, norm in the, in the community. I'm talking about if I have to deal one-on-one -on -one with someone like that who you know, continually exhibits that particular behavior pattern. So I'm asking for just your opinion on how you would deal with that particular person. I think I would ask the person who, is, who habitually tosses their can out the window of their car, do you know how much that's costing? Do you know what that's doing to your taxes? Um, you, you know, think about it. Think about the cost. Think about all the people that come to our community, take one look at all the crap on the ground and say, I'm not going to move there. I'm getting out of here. This place is awful. These people are idiots. Um, you know, I mean, that's how I would explain it to, to somebody for whom that, somebody who's a member of a group for whom that's a norm, is, come on guys, you're paying, this is costing you money. You find out what their interests are, but at the same time you're building a relationship of trust, right, because trust is key for bypassing some of those emotional reactions to block out the problem altogether. Almost like a fight or flight reaction, I think, on an individual level. Mm -hmm. Question about uh, Kim. Uh, this is the last one, by the way. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting the the. the, uh, the, 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 the getting your throat cut. <laughs> <laugh
Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on what you feel the importance of the federal standards that are uh, headed our way uh, from the EPA in relation to GenX. Do you well, think that will have an impact? If we actually get some and they're meaningful, um, that's, I mean, that's the first question. It, it ask me why I might not fully trust the current iteration of the EPA. Uh, but, but if, I mean, if they're serious and if we really do get them, um, and if they unbury that buried study that, that says that, that um, we're allowing, that, that, that the current standard is way too high, and that for certain risk populations it should be like six or seven times lower, um, it, you know, this, this state, in, in Raleigh, folks say, well, we're not going to do anything more severe than, than the feds do. Um, well, if that's the case, if the feds are going to be our guideline, then, then it, could, uh, it, it could be extremely helpful in North Carolina. Thank you to our Thank speakers. You. I hope that they're going to stick around, um, and we're, we're due for, uh, uh, I, think, I think Tom is coming to tell us that we're due for a break. So one of the things I want you to know is that uh, Tim is going to stick around for our last panel. I want you all to stick around for it too because it's really going to be interesting to say what is important for the future for water. And before you go out to your break, I want to call attention to a couple of things and a couple of real generous people who are actually sponsors. If you haven't seen these really cool pens yet, be sure to pick one up at the registration table. They're my favorite because they got a stylus on the end that you can use, you know, on your smartphone. And then as you walk around out there, you're going to see some buckets filled with some really nice snacks. I don't think she knew that she was even going to win the award, but she went ahead and brought the uh, the celebration food. Lisa brought some, uh, you know, snacks that she picked up. So there are also, you know, there'll be some uh, beverages. But this is also the time when you can take a look at all the posters talk to each other, and, uh, and that's it. We'll be back in a little while. Like I said, the next panel, you definitely want to stick around.